This morning, our nation remembers September 11. Almost exactly 15 years ago at this time, the first of the World Trade Center towers fell. In a matter of minutes, thousands of people lost their lives. Already this week, if you've been listening to the news, you have heard stories of heroism and self-sacrifice from that day, of people who have rebuilt their lives after the tragedy. But the senselessness of such evil remains. We wonder why someone would throw away their life simply to cause others pain and suffering. We wonder what is wrong with someone that they think flying a plane into a building is the next logical step for their life. And how could anyone think that God would honor such an act? And if we're honest, we wonder why didn't God stop it? We could, back, we could look back just a little less far to, this, to the destruction in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. We can stand in shock and at the power and destruction of the storm and also at the mangled support efforts that left thousands stranded at the Superdome with little food and water. And we wonder, why does God allow such suffering? Or just over a year ago, The world stared in horror at the body of a little Syrian toddler who drowned trying to escape the violence of his homeland with his family. And then, too, we wondered why. How can God allow such suffering? Where is God in the midst of such pain? Or we can turn back to the 90s and the drought and famine suffered by South Sudan. Perhaps no picture stuck in people's imaginations more than this of this little starving girl crawling to a UN feeding station as a vulture looks on waiting to pounce. And we wonder, where was God in that moment? Or we can look back a few generations further and we remember the gates of Auschwitz and the horrors witnessed there during the Holocaust. I remember when I was a sophomore in high school taking German class, and three weeks into class, we watched videos of the American soldiers coming into the concentration camps with the bulldozers moving the piles of bones of the emaciated victims being set free, finally. I can't get those images out of my mind. Those of you who have seen them probably can't either. And we wonder, where was God then? Why didn't God stop that? How can he allow such things? Closer to home, we all have stories of personal suffering and loss, tragedies that don't make sense to us, grief that goes unexplained, loss that still stings, suffering still weighing us down. This is not the happiest way to start a new education year, is it? But over the next couple of weeks, we're going to spend time looking at suffering, at those moments when God just doesn't make sense to us. We're going to look at those moments through the lens of Scripture. Specifically, we're going to look at them through the book of Job. As the story occurs, Job likely lives during the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, during the time of the patriarchs, though the book was probably written down much later than that. It's not so much history as philosophical debate structured around a story of suffering as as ancient people wrestle with the question, why do bad things happen? Where is God in the midst of our pain? Many of us know the beginning of the story well. We, We remember the scene of Satan coming to God, and he basically says to God, Job only loves you because you give him everything he wants. If you take that away, then Job won't love you anymore. And God agrees to let Satan take it all away and let Job suffer to see what happens. It's honestly a horrifying picture of Satan and of God in some ways. Why would God do that? Why would he cause such suffering just to test Job, to win a debate? We know all of this as the readers because we can read the story. But Job doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know this is some test, some battle between God and Satan. All Job knows is that he is hurting and he is in pain, and he is suffering, and it doesn't seem like it's ever going to stop. And so for the next couple weeks, we're going to try to attempt to enter into Job's story as he experienced it, not knowing the background, not knowing the resolution, just entering into 
the pain and the suffering and the wrestling with where is God in the midst of our pain? What do we do when God doesn't make sense to us anymore? To begin, we turn our attention, attention today, to, today to Job chapter 1. Hear the word of our Lord for us. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. And the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. When suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them. They are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect together on this most troubling of stories, we ask that you would speak, that you would speak words of insight and understanding, but also of comfort and hope as we all have walked through times when you don't make sense, when life feels overwhelming. Father, in those times, may you meet with us and give us the comfort we need. Father, we pray that you would speak now, for we, your children, are ready to listen. Amen. We only read the beginning of Job's trials. In chapter 2, Satan comes back to God and complains to God that Job would have sinned. He would have cursed God if only God would have let Satan afflict Job with physical pain. And so God relents and lets Satan afflict Job with physical pain. And Job gets boils and sores all over his body. Even Job's wife urges him to curse God and die. It is so bad. But Job refuses. He trusts God even when he doesn't understand what God is doing, what God is up to. But he's left with this question of why. Why does God do this? Why does God let the suffering continue? He just wants it to end. And so in chapter 3, he begins a long lament of his suffering. And he even says he wishes he was never born. Or if he was born, why did his mom feed him? Why didn't she just abandon him and let him die in, in infancy? And then he asks this in Job chapter 3. Why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul? To those who long for death that does not come, who search for it more than for hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave. Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? Job experiences all this suffering. He sees and all this grief and pain and simply wants it to end. It makes no sense. He's overwhelmed. Have you ever been there in your life? Have you ever been overwhelmed by the challenges you face, not known where to turn, not even sure how to make sense of what is happening to you, wondering where God could be and why God could allow that to happen? Have you ever suffered like that? I know that many of you have. Job is not alone in his suffering. We are not alone in our suffering. Many have gone through those trials and struggles. Job complains, he laments to God, but let me, let me let you in on a secret this morning. At the end, Job is declared righteous to God, by God. He complains for chapter after chapter after chapter. He wishes he was dead. He complains that God isn't fair to him, that God is being unjust, 
And yet God declares Job to be the righteous one in the end. That tells us something about God when we're in times of suffering. You can be angry with God. You can be confused by God. You can complain to God. You can tell God he's doing a bad job being God. And God doesn't get angry. And God doesn't turn his back. And God doesn't abandon you. He doesn't declare that sin. That's what it means to follow, to struggle and know that God is the one in charge. And so when things aren't going well, God's the one you turn to. Even in your frustration, even in your anger, even in your confusion, you can go to God and God will hear and God will listen and God won't turn away. Job complains and yet God still declares him to be the righteous one. His friends not so much. Job has some wonderful, good religious friends who come alongside to try to comfort him, but they don't do so well. They seem more concerned with explaining away Job's suffering or trying to get rid of their discomfort with his suffering rather than actually shouldering Job's burden with him and walking with him in this difficult time. And in the process, his friends highlight three bad responses we as Christians can often have to other people's suffering. First is his friend Eliphaz. Eliphaz blames the victim. He comes to Job, and he sits down, and he says, Job, I know you're in a lot of pain. I know everything's gone wrong, but it's really all your fault. Just admit it. You deserve this, he says. In fact, this is what he says in Job 4. He says, Should not your piety be your confidence, and your blameless ways your hope? Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God they perish. At the blast of his anger they are no more. When you're going through a hard time, don't you wish your friends would come alongside and tell you, well, bad things only happen to people who deserve them? That's Eliphaz. He comes to Job and says, I know all your kids were killed, all your wealth is gone, and now you're in physical agony and pain all the time, but I want you to know, God is just, you deserve this. This is what your deeds earned for you. That's the kind of friend everybody wants, isn't it? But before we're too hard on him, think about how often we can fall into that same trap. Have you ever heard someone say that people who are poor, well, they're poor because they don't work hard enough? It's their own fault, right? Have you ever heard someone talk about their friend whose teenager is rebelling? Well, you know, if they had been more attentive when they were younger, these things wouldn't happen, don't you know? Because it's their parents' fault if their kid is struggling in some way. Have you ever heard people talk about someone who's going through divorce and they point out all the ways that person did a bad job in their marriage? Well, you know, if they would have paid better attention to their spouse, if they wouldn't have worked so much but been home more often, you know, clearly they didn't do things very well. I saw that one coming. Did, I saw it before they ever walked down the aisle. You could see already there's things just weren't right there. As if your marriage or your relationships are always perfect and you never mess up. As if messing up in a marriage is just, is, is, means you deserve to get divorced and go through that pain. And yet we often can blame others for the struggles they go through. Or when health issues arise, this is a new thing in the last 10, 15 years. When people get, get sick and they get cancer, now we look at, well, do they drink a lot of pop and a lot of junk food? When they have health issues, if we look at their diet, or do they not exercise enough? Well, you know, if they'd exercise more, then they wouldn't have the heart attack. As if people who are eat well and exercise never get cancer and never have heart attacks and never get sick. Your odds might change, but it happens to people of all different health standards. But it's so easy to want to blame the victim because there's a reality. If it's their fault in some way, then it means I can do something to make sure that won't happen to me. If your kid's struggling because you're a bad parent, well, if I'm a good parent, my kids won't struggle. If you have cancer because you eat bad food, well, if I eat good food, then I won't get it. If you have heart struggles because you don't exercise, but I do, well, then I won't have heart problems. And it's a way for us to try to make sure we don't have to suffer. To try to feel like we have control in a world that can't be controlled. It's not about comforting them. It's not even about what's true theologically. It just makes us feel safer 
in a world that isn't safe. And so sometimes we blame the victim for the suffering they're going through. Other times we don't blame the victim, but we try to explain the suffering away with the promise of future blessing. This is Job's second friend. Bildad comes and says, Job, I know you're in a lot of pain now, but don't worry, God will bless you more in the future and then it won't seem so bad. This is what Bildad says in Job 8. He says, but if you will seek God earnestly and plead with the Almighty... If you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your prosperous state. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will your future be. So Bildad basically says to Job, Job, I know you lost all of your children and you lost all of your wealth, but don't worry, God will bless you more later in the future so that this loss won't seem so bad. Is that the most heartless, cold, stupid thing you've ever heard? And yet, I've been in funeral homes, and I've been in hospitals with parents who have just lost a child after giving birth, and I've heard people say, don't worry, you can have another one. As if having another child somehow will take away the pain of losing this child that they had in their arms for only a few moments. As if any future blessing can make that pain no longer be pain. It's like if, if someone loses their job and the way you comfort them is say, well, God must be at work in this, so he must have a better plan for you in the future, a better job. Of course, they had a job and now they don't have a job and they need one now and they don't yet have that job. It's just a way to skip over the reality of their suffering, isn't it? To say, we know God will bless you later, so let's not deal with the reality of where you are now. Because it, minim it reduces our discomfort with suffering, with pain. And maybe it lets God off the hook. Maybe we feel like if God lets bad things happen, but later he blesses people, well, then those bad things weren't so bad. And maybe we don't have to deal with the fact that we have a God we can't always understand. He does things that don't make sense to us, that seem cruel sometimes to us, because we don't get it. Maybe that's why. Sometimes we blame the victim. Sometimes we try to explain away the suffering with a promise of future blessing. And other times we do what Job's third friend Zophar does. He doesn't blame Job. He doesn't promise future blessings. He just tells Job, you're too dumb to understand. That's what he says. He says it more eloquently. It's all in poetry. He says in Job 11, he says to Job, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They're deeper than the, than, the, than the depths below. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. In other words, God's ways are higher than your ways. You don't understand why this suffering isn't as bad as you think because God's so much bigger than you. If you got how big God was, then you'd understand, but you're so puny and stupid because you're just a person. You can't get it, and so you don't understand. We never do this to adults, hopefully. But we do it to our kids, don't we? If you have a teenager and they're going through the turmoil of the teenage years and the drama of being a teenager, how often as parents aren't we tempted to say, well, later you'll understand. As if the pain they're in now will be taken away because later they'll understand that it wasn't as big, as big a deal as they thought it was. It's a way to minimize and avoid the reality of their suffering. Basically say, you don't get it. You're not smart enough yet. If you were smart like me, you'd know this isn't as big of a deal as it feels like. No one ever says that about their own suffering. I'm too stupid to get it, but it must not be a big deal. No one says it about their own, but we can be tempted to say about others. That's what Zophar says about Job. Job, you're just too dumb. We don't, we don't say it that way, do we? Because what do we say when we want to tell someone that they should just, you know, move on from their suffering? Well, you know, God is, is, is mysterious. He has mysterious ways. It's a great religious phrase, isn't it? You feel good when you say it, but it's stupid. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's stupid. Because you only say that when you can't explain the bad thing that's happened to someone. It's a way to say, I don't know either. But I want to feel religious when I give you my answer. I don't know. That's what we're doing. That's what Zophar does. I don't know, because if you read his whole thing, he goes on for chapters. He doesn't know why God did it either. God's ways are beyond him too. He doesn't know. He's just confused too. Maybe a better question 
for us, rather than how do we try to explain suffering, is how does God respond to suffering? How does God respond in those moments when God doesn't make sense to us either? How does God respond when he sees the tragedies of 9-11, or Katrina, or the Sudan, or Syria, or the Holocaust? What does God do? The temptation as believers, I think, is to want God to respond to those tragedies the way we would. We respond, honestly, we respond by going to war, don't we? We go to war, we get revenge, we make the evil people pay. We respond with violence to violence. This is the same response the Jewish people had. If you read through the Psalms, you read them carefully, not the happy ones, but the really mad, sad ones, you'll you'll come across lines that are horrifying to read. They talk about how they long for the day when God will let them defeat their enemies so they can smash their enemies' children's heads against the rocks. That's what they want to do to their enemies. That's horrifying, isn't it? But that's how humans respond when unjust things happen to us. We want to get even. We want to make them suffer like we suffer. Even Jesus' disciples, after living with him for three years, want to respond with with to evil with violence. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus is rejected by a Samaritan village as he's heading toward Jerusalem. And James and John, the sons of thunder, come to Jesus. Now, remember, Peter, James, and John are Jesus' three closest disciples. So two of his three closest friends come to Jesus and say, Jesus, they rejected you. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy the village? Now, In their defense, James and John think because they know Jesus and they trust God, if they ask God to send down fire from heaven, God will do it. That's some pretty strong faith. Not so much on their side as they think if someone rejects Jesus, what they should do is kill them in a fire. Because that's the human way to respond to pain and suffering. We want revenge. We want to get even. Jesus, of course, in Luke 9 rebukes them. Because God has another plan to deal with evil and suffering in our world. God doesn't respond to evil and suffering by causing more suffering in our world. God responds to the suffering of our world by entering into the suffering personally. He comes and suffers with us. Jesus comes and lives among us as a normal person. He gets hungry. He gets lonely. He gets tired. He probably got a cold or two. He had a bad night of sleep sometimes. He faced the stinging rejection of his hometown. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends. He was abandoned by all of them. He was condemned to death by the enemies of his own people at the request of the leaders of his own people. And then he was whipped and beaten and mocked and spat on and then killed in the most agonizing way humans could devise. God lets evil do its worst to him. He takes all the suffering that we can endure, and he piles it on Jesus. And in the middle of his suffering, this is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 23. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing in the middle of his suffering, in the middle of evil being done to him, the response of God is forgiveness. Evil does its worst to God, and God forgives. The empires and corrupt forces of their day destroy Jesus' body. They break it down. They throw it away. And three days later, after they've done their worst, God comes back. Death has its way, evil does its worst, and in the end we find in Jesus they don't have the power we think they do because their power doesn't last. They can't beat God. God comes back. This is at least a part of the gospel message for us that when we suffer, our God suffers too. That when we grieve, our God grieves with us too. That when we see the oppression and evil of our world, our God sees it, and he is oppressed by that same evil. He walks straight into the worst that our world can do, and he endures. We do not suffer alone, because God stands with. God walks with and sits by our side, and ultimately we know evil can't defeat him. He will endure, and he will come back, and he will bring us back too. 
So how do we as a people of the cross who follow that kind of God, how do we now live in light of the suffering and evil of our world? What should we now do? What does it look like? Let me tell you a story of Philip Haley. Philip Haley grew up on the west side of Chicago in the 1920s at the height of the Prohibition era. He grew up in what he and his brothers called the Cockroach Apartment Building because of their many six-legged pets. He literally saw Dillinger killed on his street and his body carried away. He lived in the heart of the gang crime area of Chicago in the 20s. He was a Jew growing up in in anti-Semitic America as well. And in World War II, he joined the army and went to fight against the Germans. After the Holocaust, he became one of the leading authorities on the Holocaust, writing about it in his book, The Paradox of Cruelty. But when you dig deep into the reality of evil, evil begins to dig deep into you. And Haley spent much of his adult life battling the demons of the Holocaust that wouldn't wouldn't leave him alone. He battled depression and anxiety. And on one night when he was most distraught, when he didn't know what to do, and he was at his end, and he was contemplating the worst that he could do to himself, Unable to sleep because of the images of cruelty he had in his mind from reading of all of the horror of the Holocaust, he picked up a book of essays about those who resisted, about the resistance in France in World War II. And he read an essay about the resistance at La Chambon, a small village in France. They were Huguenots. For those of you who don't know any of your your church history stuff, the Huguenots were the Reformed people who were French, not Dutch. So those of you who are Dutch Reformed people, they're like our siblings. I'm, I'm part French Huguenot, so I'm a little proud of La Chambon today. So there was this little French Huguenot reformed village that resisted the Germans. But they took their faith seriously, and Jesus commanded to turn the other cheek and to, and to not respond with violence. So they did not resist with violence. Instead, they spent the war hiding Jewish children from the Nazis, risking their lives every day as they hid the children in their homes. As he read the story, he, the tears began to fall as he was reminded again that there is goodness, there are those who will do good and risk their lives for others in our world. And later, he wrote a full history of that town in um, in the book called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed. As many authors do, he went on kind of a speaking tour to promote the book, and when he was lecturing on the book in Minneapolis, a woman with an obvious French accent stood up, and she asked him where that village was located. He clarified the exact small area of France where it was, and she said... That's the village that saved my three children. There was a moment of silence before the mother went on to thank him for telling the story of La Chambon so that her American neighbors could begin to understand her children and what their life was like. And then she said this, The Holocaust was the storm, lightning, thunder, wind, rain. Yes. And La Chambon was the rainbow. I'm assuming in church today, I don't have to tell anyone the illusion she was making to the story of the flood. We're the ones who are called to be the rainbow, who are called to be the sign that even when the worst is happening, God has not abandoned his world, that God is still at work, that there is still hope of life to come. May we be that rainbow in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplace, wherever God has placed us. May you believe this gospel and live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that when we are in the midst of our suffering, you you come alongside, that there is nothing we can endure that you do not understand, that there is never anything we can go through that you will abandon us to. Father, we ask that as well, that as you walk with us, you would help us to be the rainbow in the lives of those who are suffering, those who are struggling, those who are in pain, that in us they might get a glimpse of your love and care. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.